Texas for ADHD. Hello everyone, I'm Daniela and I'm a coach at the ADHD Advocate. It's so great to be with you today. Welcome to week three of our ADHD Empowerment Month LinkedIn Lives. Today I'll be speaking about success tips for ADHD at work, specifically some practical strategies for thriving in the workplace. If you have any questions, please do post them in the comments section as we will be hosting a Q&A on um, this in November to address all of your questions. So just a bit about me and my background. So um, work-wise, it was always within the realm of math. So I've worked in finance, including audit and in tax. I also worked as a maths teacher. I work as a maths tutor still currently. And um, I also have a background within youth work. So um, I worked for youth movement for a year and that is another interest and passion of mine. And I coach high schoolers and uni students as well. But for our focus today, it's all about the workplace. So as you can imagine, I've worked in quite a range of workplace settings and not a lot of them are well geared up to support those of us who have ADHD. So I had my own negative experience with one of these workplaces, which made me very passionate about helping people who have ADHD to find strategies that you guys need for yourselves rather than to necessarily rely on the management at work. Um, a lot of managers and people in HR don't necessarily have an amazing understanding of ADHD and it's not necessarily their fault either. Um, so that's something that I'm working on with the ADHD Advocate to provide some ADHD training in the workplace. So if your organisation might be interested, then get in touch. But back to you guys, because this is really going to be focused all on how you can support yourselves and how you can get the support that you need. Um, so to dive straight into it, the first tip that I have for you today is to focus on your strengths and where possible to delegate your weaknesses. So we all have things that come to us naturally that we're naturally good at and gifted at and we may not even necessarily think of them as strengths. You might be really good at talking to people. Um, so a lot of jobs kind of expect you to do a bit of everything, right? So you, you've got to be the people person, but you've also got to do the admin side of things. And admin, for example, something that we really struggle with. It's not very exciting. There's not a lot of dopamine being fired in our brain. It's not very rewarding. It can be quite monotonous and boring. Um, so where there is some flexibility within the work, especially if you are a manager or have people that work under you or that you work closely with, try and rejig some of the responsibilities that you have so that you can focus more on the things that come naturally to you. You can spend more time in creative thinking, for example, and other people can deal with those things. Um, a second tip for you is to remove distractions from your workplace. Now, that might sound obvious, <laughs> Um, but that's something we can forget to do. So, for example, if you don't need your phone to do your job, maybe keeping it in your bag or if you're working from home, keeping it in another space so it doesn't distract you. Um, and, you know, like the other distractions, like just things that don't belong in the room. So, you know, you might have some laundry sitting piled up on the side. Does that really need to be there? And then you're just constantly thinking about the laundry that needs to get done. So really, we want to think about what is an ideal setup for our workspace and how can we reduce any kind of distractions or disturbances from that place. And tip number three is to use teamwork. Um, as mentioned before, a lot of us are working with other people and we already mentioned how we can delegate some things to others but a lot of us really enjoy working with others it can hold us accountable but as well as that just you know being able to bounce off of somebody else and um you know to, to be part of something to work on something together and to build everyone doing their part um and that as much as possible you know if you're sitting with a project alone how can you incorporate some teamwork into this 
even if that's asking your manager if they have time to review it with you or a colleague what are their thoughts on the project or you know um seeing if maybe somebody can take part of your project and you can do a part of theirs and that way you've got more teamwork we're just naturally people pleasers and um we can use that to our advantage that doesn't have to be a negative thing um another thing that fits in there is a concept of body doubling so it's almost like you're working with somebody else but you've got two people who are working on a task at the same time so that can give us like extra boost motivation excitement to get on with the work that we need to be doing that we may not necessarily want to do. So somebody who's in a workplace setting, if you're in the office, you'll naturally have this, there are people around you who are working. And if you're at home, it might be virtually body doubling, or it could be that you take yourself to the coffee shop or to the library for certain tasks that way you can see other people working too. And that's really encouraging for you to be able to um, get on with that piece of work that you really don't want to do. Um, so tip number four is to bring things into the visual field. So we love to rely on our memory sometimes, and that's not always a great thing because we have a poor working memory we don't remember things day to day. And what that means is that firstly, we need to have things written down, right? As much as we have it in our head and we know we're going to do it. And yeah, um, if it's not written, it's not as likely to happen. Um, so if there's something that's really important for you to do, having it somewhere that you're just naturally going to see it. So either like a post it on the wall, or you might have like words or note that you use to keep on top of tasks and to kind of like have it on the top there or just you know a document that you're using all the time that way and, and make it visually appealing as well right um so you know not, you don't want to over complicate a color coding system but you know having categories for things can be helpful as well and yeah, having it visual, having it in our face is going to remind us to do that thing that needs to be done. But, you know, you don't necessarily want to see everything up all at once. So, you know, kind of thinking about what works best for you and how much you want to see in one go and having written every, having everything else written down somewhere else. Um, tip number five is to plan smart goals. So I'm not going to speak in too much detail about this stephanie mentioned it yesterday with her program that she does with um a lot of business owners but and and uh, business leaders but you want to have goals that are specific measurable achievable realistic and time bound if you go through each of those and kind of actually plan a goal right again sometimes we just have it in our head and that's not enough so to really spell it out and break it down our brains work like all or nothing so it really helps to kind of find that gray zone in the middle and to you know break down what it is that we're trying to achieve into small bite-sized tasks and set up the accountability and that's something that I do with clients all the time. Um, and, you know, might be worth finding a coach, but we'll come on to that. Tip number six is all about structured flexibility. So what I mean by that is that on the one hand, we're very resistant to having structure. Um, you know, we kind of like the idea of being free and being able to choose what we want to do in the day and not being limited by having to do things at set times. Um, on the other hand, if you have tried to <laughs> just, you know, go free without a plan and no structure, um, how well has that worked for you? And the answer is that we do need structure, but at the same time, we don't want to feel limited by it. And once you realize that we actually do need the structure, 
and that can be our best friend so we're no longer pushing things off and you know leaving things to the last minute adding a lot of stress into our lives but finding the right balance with flexibility which we also crave and desperately want um is the way forward so what i mean by that is let's say for example you have a rough guide for yourself that when i start my work day the first half an hour or so i'm looking at emails the next hour is a good time for me to have meetings um as is the hour straight after lunch um and then i've got time in between that first meeting and lunch to work on project a and i've got time after my meeting after lunch to work on project b and that way if something goes wrong so you need something for project A, which you do not have. And you say, okay, so I'll ask somebody for it. But in the meantime, I can get on with project B. And when you get to the afternoon, you can go back and work at project A. And now you've got the information that you were waiting on. So something like that, you've got structure, but it's not a forced like set times making us feel resistant. It's something as well that, you know, one can try and develop for themselves or work with a coach to develop. Um, tip number seven is to create accountability for your success. So if you do work in a typical workplace, you will likely have a manager and therefore you will naturally have a level of accountability. Of course, some managers are more hands on than others. And, you know, you might have that anyway. But even so, firstly, for people who don't have that, we want to look at how can I be held accountable for the tasks that I need to do? Because we are, we thrive when we have a level of accountability. As much as we want to do certain tasks and we know we need to do certain tasks, if there's no one sitting and waiting there for it, it's a lot harder for us to do it. And that ties in as well with what we were saying earlier about us, you know, using our people pleasing skills in our favour. If we know somebody is waiting on something from us, then we're going to want to do it a lot better. Um, and then even if you do have a manager who does hold you accountable, if you've got a bigger project that you're working on, you might need more accountability than just that deadline at the end of the month. Because if you're supposed to break that down and do part one of the project, and part two and part three and four, you know, one part each week, our brains are not necessarily going to do part one in week one. We might say, oh, well, you know, I might just leave it for next week. This week, I'm just planning it. And then I've got an overview and I've got other priorities and other tasks. And I'll leave it for week two. And what happens on week two? You say, oh, well, it'd be lovely to start. But you know what? There's, you know, I'll do it in week three. And suddenly you get to week four and you've got to do the whole project in one week. And that is not a fun feeling. <laughs> so we'd like to, you know, help ourselves to kind of be able to break that down, complete it earlier. But the only way to complete it earlier is if we have some sort of deadline earlier. So working with your manager or somebody at work to be able to help have that deadline is really key for your success. And more than just asking somebody to you know, arrange a deadline with you, that can be hard. It can be really hard to be proactive and to set it up and to, you know, and maybe your manager is not the type of person who's going to be able to do that for you. So a really great trick is to actually flip it on its head rather than you having to ask your manager, oh, like, I want to do this part here. Do you mind checking in on me after a week? You, you turn it around and you say, right, I am doing this section and I'm going to send it to you by the end of week one. That way you've put the onus onto yourself. They are expecting it from you, but they're not going to chase you. So it brings that level of accountability without having to ask for it. 
they are going to be sitting there waiting for your project and even if they don't mind so much whether you do it or not the fact that you've said you're going to do it and you know they're expecting it brings out that people pleasing element as well and will get us to you know get our act together and find a way find the time to do it um and to then be able to complete the project tip number eight is that praise is your secret weapon so as much as you can when colleagues compliment you when managers compliment you and they tell you what you're doing great make a note of that because our brains are so easy to forget <laughs> not only just to forget but also we're we've got this RSD, rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So anything that's negative that is said is going to stick with us so much so that you actually need four positive things to outweigh one negative comment that has been made. And how are we going to get those four positives in that moment is if we already have it written. And if we don't have to rely on our difficult working memories, to bring to us all of those positive things um, so creating a list for yourself either on your computer or written where you note down anything positive it doesn't even have to be praises from other people it should also come from yourself so if you say oh you know i'd actually been struggling with that task before but now i'm doing it so much better than i ever did that is when you kind of want to make a note of that Tip number nine is to seek specialist ADHD support. So obviously, as mentioned, a lot of managers and colleagues don't necessarily understand ADHD and therefore are not necessarily able to support you the way that you need it. So seeking somebody who understands it like a coach um, is definitely the way to go. Um, and there are a lot of therapists who also, you know, they might be able to support you in some areas, but if they don't really understand ADHD, they might kind of give you, right, step by step, like, you know, you can do this and this, but it doesn't work for a neurodivergent mind, you know, um, for example, oh, if you just like make a plan and then stick to it, <laughs> and then... Uh, that should work but you know we find starting things hard we find sticking things hard and um, so really need somebody who's going to understand you and your brain and what support you need to be able to thrive so definitely seek the ADHD coach that's right for you the ADHD advocate have about 15 for you to choose from so no shortage there um, and some like me will specialize in helping professionals um, so Think about what you'd need from a coach and what would be right for you and get in touch. And our final tip for today is to eliminate the shame in asking for help. We think for some reason, we just have to be able to do it all. And that could be because growing up, we were expected to do certain things that we really struggled with, like being organized, like showing up on time, like not getting distracted etc and because we had all of those expectations on us that may have been unrealistic we learned that we need to be able to do the things that we can't do as well as the things that we can do so basically we have to do it all right and it's really hard to actually say no i'm struggling with something please can i get some support around here and it's really hard to also be self-aware and to realize that something's not working and to then say that even if you don't know what it is sometimes the fact that we're not really sure why we're struggling with a task means that we're not asking for help there because we feel like we have to be able to articulate what it is that we're struggling with and you could have a manager waiting for a piece of work saying why haven't you done it and you don't know. So being able to eliminate that shame, there's nothing wrong with not knowing what's going on. There's nothing wrong with not being able to do it all. 
I mean, think about this in your life. Do you, do you do everything for yourself, really? Have you ever hired a babysitter, a gardener, an accountant, a cleaner? You know, that if you really think about it, there are people who we have asked for help from in other areas of our lives even if that's not paying someone right it could be just you know asking a relative for a favor and learning to remove the shame and to ask what for, for yourself at work is going to be a massive game changer in actually being able to move forward with the tasks and not get stuck in the process so hope that you have found these tips helpful if you would like to be in touch you can find all of our details on the ADHD Advocate website and have a wonderful day. Good luck with your work and see you soon.